gentlemen, thank you so much. Welcome to this, the 774 ABC Melbourne Conversation Hour for big ideas here at the marvellous Wheeler Centre. The event is called L for Leather. Not for my former alter ego, El McFeast, who I have to say was some sort of football wild child, but for me, your host, Libby Gore, which begins with an L. And nowadays I don't like to think of myself as that kind of ratty young woman who throws frocks over heads. Nowadays I like to see myself as a kind of Oprah on crack. <laughs> anyway, where does the event come from? Well, I guess it comes from, as any neurosis does, from my childhood. And I have to say, it was a little bit disturbed. I did dabble in delinquency. And, you know, that's not uncommon for young kids to do so. And whilst some get distracted and, you know, steal cars or maybe get involved with booze or drugs, mine was a different kind of affliction. I, um... I barracked for Collingwood. Mm. And, well, you know, I have to say, there was a fanaticism in my house about football that made football a complete and utter religion. Like, I didn't hear stories about Adam and his rib. I heard stories about Peter McKenna and his kidney. <laughs> and when we were talking about messiahs and prophets, it wasn't Noah and his ark that took my fancy. No, 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 no. The story that I used to love was about Collingwood legendary coach, Fonz Kine, <laughs> who took his 1958 Collingwood team into the grand final against the favourites, the reigning premiers, they were going for four in a row, Melbourne. And Collingwood were the underdogs. Fonz Kine, the legend, he didn't know what to do. He looked to the heavens and he prayed and lo, it began to rain. <laughs> and it rained and it rained and it rained and yea, there was a flood. <laughs> and the MCG was turned into mud and rain begat mud and mud begat bog and the rain still came down. What did the prophet Fonz Kine do? Did he build an ark into which to herd his players and ship them safely to higher ground? No, he did not. He looked at his Collingwood team and then he counted up his animals <laughs> two by two, centre half back, centre half forward, full back, full forward. In those days, you only needed one ruckman. But let's face it, in those days, the best ones had two heads. <laughs> and he told them to lead with their right. And for those of them that were southpaws, go with your left. And thus, Collingwood did. They went the biffo and they secured the flag. Collingwood were delivered into the promised land with the 1958 premiership and people, it was a miracle. Now, football has changed over time and so have I as a Collingwood supporter. I no longer see things in terms of black and white. I know as well as you do that there are at least 50 shades of teal and they're all very exciting. But how has leadership changed in this most blokiest of arenas, the football field? If it's meant to mirror society, how have men changed in the way that they lead? Well, to discuss this very question, we have with us three of the best leaders of their time. Ladies and gentlemen, sitting right here with me, I have a captain of the Hawthorne juggernaut of the 60s and 70s, a dual premiership captain. He was a fearsome ruckman. He was a president of the AFL Players Association. In his time, he was number 23 from Hawthorne. He's now an equestrian, a show jumper, a man of great eloquence and insight. Would you welcome Don Scott. <laughs> Next to him, what can I say? Another Ruckman. They make me feel slim. This man, also a premiership player for the Essendon football team. Two premierships. He's a captain. He's a Norm Smith medalist. Another president of the AFL Players Association. Won numerous bests and fairest. And is now a director of the club. I would have to say it's one of the longest relationships of your life. It must be 40 years. Simon is a director of the Essendon Football Club in its beleaguered times. Would you welcome? He was number 27. He is now a business coach and success mentor. Simon Madden. And sitting, sitting on the end, wondering how on earth did I get myself into this? <laughs> So true. The most gorgeous <laughs> young man. He played for St Kilda. He was captain of St Kilda in 2007 and then went on to play in a premiership side 
for Collingwood. He's just recently retired. He is the current president of the AFL Players Association, expecting his first child early next year. Number 12 he was for Collingwood. <laughs> he stands before you as the man looking forward into the future in his brand new life. Luke Ball, everybody. Thank you. So, gentlemen, firstly, thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. Just the fact that we're even talking about men and leadership, Don, is that a change from the old days? Like, would you talk about it? Well, I think in the football arena, yes, because it's usually about what happens in football, which is pretty mundane, really, isn't it? Well, you seem to think it is. Well, I think it is. You know, you, you just regurgitated the same thing for years and years. So just programmed as leaders? What, leaders? Yeah. No, leaders always emerge, and I mean, they do in football clubs. They Leaders always emerge in, in whatever you go into or whatever committees, someone will emerge as a leader. So what are the qualities, Simon? For instance, who would you say was the pivotal influence of a man in your life, Simon? Uh, woman. <laughs> woman? Well, no, it just is because I, um, or, or, you know, I started playing football at 16, which is unheard of now. Um, why? Well, because they start at 12. <laughs> no, no, league, foot, league, football league football at 16. <laughs> so you can't get drafted early. And uh, my father died when I was 13. What uh, happened? Well, a man of the uh, ex-servicemen who um, uh, married late, uh, had his fed share of alcohol, uh, smoked two packets of Viscount uh, a day, real coffin nails, um, had half a lung cut out because of uh, TB. They never said that's what it was. Was told by the doctor to give up smoking, of course, so automatically increases intake, mm. and died of a heart attack mowing the lawn in oh. the backyard, So, and uh, heart attacks hereditary. So both Justin and myself, uh, we don't smoke and we don't mow lawns, just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> Never know. And so the, so the biggest influence for me then was a mother who had three big... Because we had an older brother, myself and Justin's younger brother, and um, she had to bring them up those three big boys in an era where there wasn't a lot of money in the house. At uh, times she was working two jobs, had, knew, not, knew not one end of a football from the other. And so she was a big, of course, a big influence. And then for me, being 16, the main leaders for me were the, either the teachers at school, but the football coaches. My first coach was Des Tubman. Ah. Uh, it's what foot, was he it's, like? Uh, he, I can't, I'll break the microphone, shout, you know, he's one of the old, oh, coach like this, you know, and the vein would stick out here and the muscles would stick out and I was 16 and I was fearful. Um, and it's, it's Essendon folklore, he got us one Sunday morning to crawl a lap on our hands and knees of Windy Hill. He did too, he was captain coach and we crawled the lap of Windy Hill on our hands and knees. Because? Well he, said you, well, he said you didn't get down your hands and knees enough yesterday and get in on the ball. <laughs> you didn't get down your hands and knees enough and in the packs, and we're going to practice. And we thought, match practice. Did a lap on our hands and knees. We're told to keep our feet these days. Times have changed. <laughs> have you you're ever on the ground, you're out of the contest. Yeah, keep <laughs> on your feet. Have you, would that happen now? Luke, would you take that from... No, well, the, the 18 and 19 year olds that ask why. That's the difference yes. these days. They get, they get programmed to, to come in and... Um, I mean, I'm only 30, but even when I started 12 or 13 years ago, you walk into the club and there's Robert Harvey and Stuart Lowe and Nathan Burke and it's speak when spoken to. And I probably didn't say a word for, um, you know, a year or so, um, other than to my, my fellow draftees around the same age. And then um, 10 Is or 12... Is there that kind of system within the club? Well, like... there's not, but there's a, there was still that unofficial type, type system, which, you know, would, would date it's back always to, to those sort of days. And I, and I still think there's room for an element of that, but um, you know, kids these days, they, they, they come straight in and it's like they've known you for 10 years. And, and if, if Nathan was to say, righto boys, down on your knees and, and crawl a lap of the Westpac Centre, they'd say, well, why are we doing this, Nathan? And I think that's a really good point because, and blame people like me, because we've educated our children. And I've got, we used to have four kids, now I've got four adults. And in my time, you'd say to the coach, why? And he'd say, because I say so, mm. and you'd do it. Now, if you said to a young person, either in football or in business or in a university or whatever, and say, they say, why? And you say, because I say so. They go, well, I won't, because I say so. <laughs> and you're on equal ground. And a lot of people don't know how to handle that. But if you say to them, if they say why, and you go, well, for you this, for me this, for the group and the greater good, and they agree, they will do it even better. But they won't do it blindly. And that's what happens with education. You will question the status quo. And I think that's a very healthy thing. I'll go to the status quo and education in just a moment. But, Don, in your time, 
Who was the seminal male influence in your life? What was the home? Was it home? It was a fashion was designer, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm unlike Simon. My mother died when I was 10, so I was brought up by my father. So, um, Well, that yeah, would have been hard. Well, it was. He had a choice of which way to go, uh, whether to be the nurturer or the disciplinarian. He chose the disciplinarian. So we were brought up a particular way, and then you go down and... Strict. So it was really yeah, strict. Yeah, really strict. And uh, you go down to the football club and... Um, you know, I suppose I was prepared, and we, we all were, because society is different to what it is now. And you had a coach, and John Kennedy was my first senior coach, and he had that aura about him. So you, you know, what he said, you did. Uh, you never questioned. You just did what what you were told. You never answered back, and um, that was that was the way society was. Do you reckon that's why you ended up so brave and so scary? Because, like, if you lost your mum when you were just little, you'd have to be brave to face the big bad world, like you'd have to be. Well, not really. I, John Kennedy uh, never drew the piece of string in and he just let me keep, he let me keep going. And, Did he? Yeah, he didn't, uh, didn't curtail and, uh, you know, he'd insinuate and, um, and I'd, I'd take him up on his insinuation. What? I was, I was 17 my first year, I think, playing against him. He was scary, he was don't scary. worry. He was scary. I can imagine. I mean, I... I he am... kicked me first gut... First, he will deny this. First game I played against him, he kicked me in the ankle. And I went, how do I respond? I just don't know how to do this, you know. But Simon was a very good, good youngster, and it's like the old lion. And... But just the same, Simon also dished it out years, years later, because I was down at Melbourne, and... Uh, I was coaching Steve O'Dwyer, who was a very, very good uh, young ruckman, and uh, we were playing Essendon at Melbourne at this particular day, and I said, oh, well, you're going to Madden, he's pretty weak, you know, you just <laughs> go in and jump into him, get your knees up at the centre bounds. <laughs> well, Simon really fixed poor Stephen up before <laughs> half-time. I don't know whether it was because he was an old St Bernard's boy, but that was a dirty act for he's the iron <laughs> player. <laughs> I don't, want to, I don't want to turn this into a sports night, but he started it, all right? Let's go. <laughs> Luke, could that happen now? Well, it, it, it does to a... You've got to be more clever about it, obviously, because there's... Too many know, cameras. However, however many cameras on, on every, uh, every aspect of the, of the field. And actually, that's probably what's ruined my career, the old behind-the-goals camera. Not only myself, but many careers, that'll ruin, because... There's nowhere to hide um, when the coach is, is reviewing the game and he flicks to the behind the, co behind the goals camera if you're the one walking or not where you're supposed to be. It's, uh, it, uh, it gets highlighted. So, um, but there, that's, uh, I guess that's where footy's gone. With all those cameras comes the, broad, the broadcast right, so can't really bite the hand that feeds you, can you? But that's interesting. Do you think it makes it wussy, Don, the fact that you can't you know, dish out your own form of rough justice? Well, it always, and it has been, not that... You know, I read an article in the... Well, it was the history of football, and it was in the Argus, and uh, it was back in the 1800s, and that was the, the, the dominate... Uh, not the... That was the thing that came out, that it was a manly sport. Yeah. And, uh, and it was much tougher than, you know, when I came along, prior to me, it was much tougher. In the 50s and earlier than that, they used to just carry one man in the team who was the enforcer. That was just his job, the enforcer. And... Um, yeah, and, that's how, and that was the way football was played. So what was John Kennedy like as a coach? Did he wrap up your whole football game in the way you defined yourself as a man? Well, uh, um, I suppose there was an influence, but everything he, he, in his preaching was... Uh, football's a microcosm of life. And he was an, uh, an educated man who drew on Shakespeare and different things and, um, and used those, but... You know, what you could take out of his teachings in football and the way we, play, you know, taught us to play, you can apply to life and it does hold you in good stead. Like? Well, you know, if you keep doing the things that are right in life and you're having a bad run, for example, you know, in football, if you're training hard, you're going for the ball and you're not in form, eventually that'll turn for you and it's the same in life. And you know, in business or whatever else, if you keep doing the things that are right in business, eventually the wheel's going to turn. And, uh, and it's the same in life. Do you agree, Simon? Do you think truly that football is a microcosm of society? Oh, it is. I mean, it, and it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful analogy for life because you're out there and it's, what, it's, it's, it's actually um, analysed by so many people and everybody, has, everybody knows, uh, you know, what your failings are, etc. But um, I think, 
I think there's a whole lot of things you get out of football. And it's interesting for me, one of the things I learned early is that if you don't understand the struggle, and it's one of my mantras, if you don't understand the struggle, you'll never understand the success. And I really find that that's what happens in life. And I, I think the music, you know, we can have a great musician here uh, today, but I think you talk to musicians and sometimes they find a, they find a, oh, you know, this is an overnight success in the media, but you talk to them and they've been struggling for 10 years and 15 years to get there, but they're only seen, and they understand the struggle. A lot of people understand the struggle, but never get to the success. But a lot of people want the success without the struggle, and you, you don't get it, you just don't get it. Well, that's sort of a non-gender specific kind of matter, isn't it? Well, no, that, but that's true. That's I, I mean, that's, that's for anybody. If you, you ask anybody, you, you look at anybody, and I'm sure everybody out here has got uh, someone they admire, someone they look at, either well-known or not well-known, and if they're successful in what they've done, they've worked hard to get there. There are very, very few people, unless you, you, know, you inherit Bill Gates' wealth, that might be different, but apart from that, that's a very select few, maybe, um, you have got where you've got because you've worked really hard. And as Don said, the things... Now, I also add to that now that you've got to be a bit innovative and you've got to think a little bit wider because the world's changing so much and you've really got to look at what's the new idea. Uh, you know, question the status quo. Um, and, and but that's that. always been the case, hasn't yeah, it? it has you know, been. it's always been the case. You've just got to look outside yeah, the square. Yeah, and and both of those things, working hard, but looking outside as well. Hey, Luke, did your father tell stories about, you know, when he played the game? Did that kind of mould how you saw yourself as a man growing oh, up? Oh, actually, Dad sort of kept his brief playing career pretty pretty sort of um, quiet from from me and my older brother, which. Probably leads me to believe that he wasn't much of a player. That we haven't seen any sort of footage of him or anything. Like that. The only thing we've got is, a, is an old card, an old footy card, uh. that uh, that he that he used to let us stick on the fridge, just as a reminder that he did play and he's in a uh, in a perfect kicking motion. So he, he was able to kick. But um, every now and then, when asked, actually, I rang him today, knowing that I was doing this. Don, I know you spoke to him as well, and uh, and asked him about sort of any any sort of stories. And um, you know, he he had Tom Hafey. Uh, coach him. He had a few years at Richmond. I think around the early 70s when they were a pretty good team and winning premierships. So he didn't play a lot of footy, but um, there are some some great stories. And I think he borrows a few from Tony Jewell as well, and right. sort of possibly claims them as his own. But um, you never let the truth get in the way of a good story, do you? But one that one that he told me today was Royce Hart was obviously the pin-up boy back in those days, and they used to have um, footy camps. And I think this one was down at Portsea, and the boys all had to go and swim out around the boy and come back and. Uh, they got caught in a rip and they were slowly sort of drifting away and well, I don't think Royce was much of a swimmer at the time and um, we'll say Dad, was Tony Jewell tells a story that Tommy Hafey, the coach on the beach, sees what's happening, throws his clothes off, we all know what sort of nick he was in, charges out into the water and Tony Jewell sees him coming and he God, he's come to save me. He swims straight over the top of Tony Jewell and says, we've got to get to Royce, we've got to get to Royce. <laughs> And made sure he, he dragged him into the into the beach and, and got his sort of you know the centre forward of the century back back to back to dry land on leadership perfect that is leadership isn't it that's yeah. absolute leadership recognising what what's best for the team at the time and exactly at the time it was to save the best centre forward of all time and not your uh... Luke so, could I ask Luke a question because uh, you know I've, I've got horses Luke and um, show jumping is going in such a way that it's been in racing for a long time selective breeding you know you you put one mare with a stallion and whatever else they do that with the royal family well i think that <laughs> well i might have done it with the boar, uh, with the balls too so who do you attribute your success to because uh, you're a russo on one side and a ball on the other so do you attribute your success to the mother because uh, the russo side has got josh kennedy mm. yeah there's peter russo your uncle right. and now there's you so there's quite a lineage yeah, there see, Don, and I hope, you know, dad also said today and I hope you don't mind me saying i could have always been a scot <laughs> <laughs> Don's who dated wife, who? No, no don's, ended up, don's wife jenny was one of dad's old girlfriends so <laughs> Don pinched her off uh, off Ray and left him heartbroken. He only... oh. now listen, God, listen, just out. keep thank going God. because this we'll is going to go yeah. somewhere that I don't want <laughs> well, thank to go. God, um, thank God Jenny Russo from Packenham came along <laughs> and, um, and got him back up and going again. But yeah, so yeah, I, probably mum, really, I think, um, when you look at that. I know mum's dad, Felix, was a, a fantastic athlete. Uh, he, he played a little bit of footy down at St Kilda, which is ironic when I got drafted there. I saw a photo of him in the 50s. And he sank Kilda top, and um, I think he, in the end he, he uh, decided that family life and religion, I think at the time, were probably more important than playing footy. So, um, but I think he was probably 
the, the, the best athlete of the, of the family. And um, yeah, now I watch, you know, we watch Josh Kennedy, young Josh Kennedy, who was um, four years younger than me, but we used to sort of say he was our, our younger brother because he lived up the road. And, and it was impressive. Come and, we'd come and kick the footy when he was this big. And now, of course, I taught him everything he knows. And he's <laughs> one of the best players in the competition. And hopefully he wins his second premiership on Saturday. Well, that's an interesting, an interesting wish to have for him given you've got Don just sitting there within arm's reach. Course, However, yeah. this is the question that I wanted to ask. In terms of your dating history then, Don, since we've brought it out into the open... <laughs> <laughs> we're just... We're, no, 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 you, you brought it up. Oh, this is so, going to be embarrassing. Yeah, well, it was would about... It would have been better. I would have had four or five more inches. would have been a bit taller, probably been a bit better looking too, and had a better dress sense. So I've lucked out on all fronts. It's about that dress sense, Don. Father son, father, son rule of Hawthorne? Yeah, right. yeah. It's about that dress sense. There was a very famous photo of you going to the Brownlow Medal in the 70s and you were wearing very high-cut jeans, a cravat. Um, you, you debuted the man bag then. Well, I think that was coming out of the tribunal. <laughs> <laughs> so... He was, he was well, you know, nowadays the red carpet at the Brownlow is kind of like a tribunal. Out, you know, I didn't need a road map at that stage to find the tribunal, I can tell you. No, you've been there quite a few times. I but think it was... he was trying to show his feminine side to say, I'm not really a hard man at the, the tribunal. Well, that's, that's what he that tried was to That's what do. I was wanting to know. In terms of making those flamboyant choices of dress, and you look beautiful tonight, I like your frock. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good to have a bit of colour. Um, I want to know if you were making a real statement about the fact that you could be any kind of man that you wanted to be, that you didn't have to dress the same as every other bloke, you didn't have to be the same as every other kind of bloke, because they were brave fashion choices, and some would say sexually ambiguous. Well, yes, and I suppose I'm a product of the 60s, and uh, we're all a product of the 60s now, because that's when we first started questioning. I mean, uh, music started to change, and it started with the Stones, and... Um, the Beatles, and then it just flowed on, and you had your various movements coming out of that. And uh, I think you know, and society can be traced back to there. And um, but footy was... wasn't like that. They all dressed the same. There was everyone else, and there was oh, you. They, was, they were trying. Oh, I suppose I was. In, I was involved in the fashion industry anyway, uh, and it always interested me fashion because my grandmother was uh, a seamstress, and it always interested me fashion as, as a kid uh, growing up. And uh, I would have liked to have been a tailor. But at that stage, you know, you know, there was no future in being a tailor. But I would have really liked to have been a tailor. And uh, so I went off into the fashion industry and uh, start, had my own business. I worked down the road at Myers, got a training there and went out and did my own thing. So it always interested me, fashion. It's interesting, though, because... It was the sexual ambiguity of your interest in fashion, I guess. And nowadays, I mean, people are still talking about the fact that all footballers have to be completely and utterly straight. There can be no... Well, we haven't had any guy actually say that he's not completely of the straight and narrow uh, heterosexual variety. And that, look, that's interesting because if there's, 800, if there's 800 players, by the normal percentages, there must be. But and I, the trouble is, if if there was a gay guy playing, and he said, "I'm going," if he wanted to, if he wanted to be a fashion icon or a a, a gay icon, he put his hand up. They, you know, the media would love it for him to be the first. And I think that would actually, you know, sort of be a bit harsh. I just want to come out and say, look, part of my life is the sexuality, and it happens to be this. But let's move on and play footy. Uh, but I think the way it is that for the first person to come out, that's going to be really, really hard. But the fact is, it's happening at other levels. We know other sp sports, sports people, but then I'm going to say. I'm going, we go, yeah, OK, let's move on, let's look at the sport. I think we've, we've really got past that. Really, Could really it have past. happened in no, your day? No, not in my day, because it was just... It was, it was that, you know, that, that more English, straight, um, white Anglo-Saxon background that, you know, either Protestant or Catholic, and it's all you have to fit this mould to be the football, and if you don't fit that mould, we'll move on. It was only the English politicians that could play around with fishnets and oranges and get themselves into trouble. <laughs> Luke, what about now? So you've just had Horatio Lamomba make a fuss about Collingwood's attitude towards sexuality within the club. Oh, no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say he did that. Uh, that's sort of been the, the story that's come out of it all and, and you know, a little a picture on the wall and a, an innocent little um, gaff, I guess, from... I don't, I'm not even sure who it was, but... Um, that was only one little element of, of Harry's... Uh, he, he went through a bit of a tough time. So that was sort of a, an example that I guess he used to try and... Because um, he was all about trying to make the, the footy club a really safe environment for everyone to be themselves. And, um, you know, we're not talking about sexuality or anything, just, just to be able to express themselves. You know, footy club, 45 guys all come from 
all over the country, uh, different upbringings, different stories, and, and you know his, his story himself. That's why it's really hard. I find it hard. I'm, I'm good mates with him, um, and and why I defend him all the time too. Because when you hear his story, it's really hard to sort of relate to. Um, He's myself. had tough times. Yeah, he, he has. Yeah, he has, and he still deals with them. So, but I, could I a player could a, could a player feel comfortable in in that environment, not being you know white bred heterosexual male? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think I think even um, at the Collingwood Footy Club in the last four or five years, um, it's it's improved a lot in that area. And and I think um, especially this year, it's it's um, you know it's a really young list. That a lot of the older guys that perhaps have been set in their ways have, have moved on, and um, is, a, is a young impressionable group. So I think it has improved a lot. Um, unfortunately, Harry probably looks like he's not going to be around to enjoy it for the next couple of years. But hopefully, if he does decide to Go and get a fresh start somewhere else. That, 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 that's what he does because physically he's a, he's he's as good an athlete as I've ever played with. He's a magnificent. But he doesn't fit anymore. Uh, no. Nah, oh, well, I mean, I'm not there anymore, so I'm not sure. But perhaps it's, it's he's a um, diplomat. Yeah. No. Well, I'll say it's perhaps it's sort of a, a a bridge too far in terms of him and a few people at the club. That it, it's time for both of them to part ways on good terms. Don, in your day, never would have happened. Um, never would have happened. It's amazing just listening to Luke. Um, yeah, it just wouldn't, wouldn't have happened. Different, different altogether. Um, I think the guys nowadays are fairly precious, and th that's because of what they're involved in their environment. Because all they've got is football. They've got nothing else away from football. And I really don't think, and I don't envy them. Uh, I don't think it's a balanced life they lead. Um, I saw my son, who was uh, drafted to Hawthorne, and uh, and I watched other boys as well, and. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, that they're, they're just programmed to try and play league football. And in my case, my son was just devastated when he was cut. And you see the effect it has. It even goes back to boys at 18. They're, they're conditioned to get into this under-18 system in Victoria and, it, and to be drafted. And if they're not drafted at 18, a lot of boys are really um, affected. And, I, and, and it's, it was a, just a different system back in our day, that the pressure wasn't there as it is nowadays. In terms of defining yourself. We had to take a break because we've got some entertainment. I want to introduce you. Given that we've all got the grand final that we wanted, which is Sydney Swans versus Hawthorne, I have got a wonderful performer to perform for you. He's performing his new single. It's called Melbourne versus Sydney. He's accompanied... <laughs> by his two gorgeous cousins, Memphis and Madeline Kelly. Would you welcome Dan Kelly, everybody? On the current state of play There's a new battle every day Rental wagons They dodge the mines I hit the stadiums Get back behind the lines It's enough to see Charles Dickens Cashing in Sweet twins It's always Melbourne versus Sydney Let the best team win by the bay The Emerald City lives to fight another day There's always some kid going all the way I'm not a model No coffee connoisseur No, I'm just a bumpkin lost amongst the great auteurs But hit me up I will absolve Your sins Hey Melbourne versus Sydney Let the love shine in Again. And 
we will never, never find again. We can't pretend to be friends again. Pretend until the Melbourne versus Sydney versus Melbourne versus Sydney versus Melbourne versus Sydney versus Melbourne versus Sydney versus Melbourne versus Sydney. Melbourne versus Sydney versus Melbourne versus Sydney versus Melbourne versus Sydney versus Melbourne versus Sydney versus Melbourne versus Sydney. Like Cain and Abel on the downward slide. It's Melbourne versus Sydney in time to pick your side. And we are called to defend again. When will we ever see our wives? And men again We can pretend to be friends again Pretend until the end That's Dan Kelly with Memphis and Madeline Kelly in Melbourne versus Sydney. This is 774 ABC Melbourne and Big Ideas here at the Wheeler Centre. We're talking about men and leadership with Don Scott, Simon Madden and Luke Ball. Simon, your theory on why kids don't follow the trust, what is your theory as to why young people just don't take the word of authority anymore? Why they question? Well, oh, gee, how deep and meaningful do you want to get? Um, a, a, uh well, look, look at it this way. We're in the most information-rich time in the world. You can get information on your phone, your telly, your watch. Now, any, I mean, we used to get information, but now it's, you know, there's only one type of information, huge amount. Um, so they see the world. And you think about uh, the what prime... What were the things that you trusted? Um, not, many, not many. No, you, you trust your teammates, and that's built up trust. But about the young people now, you look at the, example, the traditional examples of leadership in our society... Uh, Catholic upbringing, the church said, I'll oh, look after kids, and then we had all the sexual assault problems. The bank said, we'll look after your money. Took all your, they took all your money away, I took your house away and kept the money. Uh, you, you start to look at all the traditional examples of leadership, and they failed, so many people. So you, then you say to the young people, oh, we want you to follow the leaders, um, and they say no. And it's interesting with a football club, they used to have very simple, we used to have a coach, a captain, a vice captain, maybe a deputy vice captain. Right now, it's not just one person's you know, right to run the footy club. It's the coach and this band of coaches and the leadership group because one person can't represent all the members of the team. If there's 40, 45, 45 blokes, you need a group of people to get a better representation of those people. I have a feeling now we're leading on to the Essendon Football Club. We can lead there if you want to. Okay. I, I'm now, I said I'm on the board, so I've got to be very careful. I can, there's some information I can give and some is... You know, it's private, private information which has not been let out to anybody, so I've got to be careful on that. But I'll give you my straightforward view. Well, Don, you asked the first question. <laughs> <laughs> now, and now, Facing I, I mean, across the square I'm and kicking si in the leg. Simon, drugs have always been, or supplements have always been in sport. You know, going back to the 60s, there were steroids available, and I had a teammate who used steroids over pre-season. Supplements were around. We had drugs back then. Kevin, that Kevin are Bartlett now, had that fish are and chips on a Friday night. That are now banned. And it was your decision as an athlete whether you took them or not. Look, now, doesn't that say the same happen nowadays? Oh, look, I'd, I'd love to say that's the way, but I was the first person drug tested in football, just happened to be. A uh, teammate tried to produce a sample after a game, and it's very hard to produce a sample, and he didn't produce enough. So then I you know, waited and produced a sample. Back then, there was one coach you, you were authority to, one phys ed person who was your authority. There was drug uh, urine test work, and there's about five things that, that, that you could take, and if you took them, they found them. Now, there's so many, there's so many more um, coaches involved, so many more influences on these people. And uh, Please, I'm not, try I'm not trying to... It sounds like you're trying to... Um, spare James Hurd. No, no, no. It I'm sounds not, like you're I'm trying talking, to abrogate I'm, the responsibility no, I, no, of a I'm senior coach. I'm talking about the players. I'm talking about the players now because um, the amount of the amount of supplements we have now. I thought it was ironic that the Brownlow Medal was sponsored by Swiss, which is a supplement company. I thought that was rather ironic. Um, 
the, the uh, FDA approved. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, but, but you know, this it's, it's the world is so much more complicated now that, and you have. It's, I'm trying to do a short answer. These people are 18 to 25 and now teenagers. So we used to have teenagers. These young men who have this this um, uh, bubble over them are now still taking a lot more time to grow up. And you, there's a whole lot of research on that. That this teenager, there never used to be a teenager. Now there's a teenager developing. That they get to 18, but they're not grown up yet. About 25, 26, they grow up. So you put these into this position. They sign a contract to say, "I'll listen to everybody above me," mm -hmm. uh, and then we put them around them. This complex world of all these other things. But in the end, we say, oh, "You're the bloke who should take the blame." And what who, I the player or the no player the player? Or... You know, a lot of people say the players. You know, the player. No, that's yeah. not the way this conversation is going. The way this conversation is going is. Firstly, we don't know what the players were injected in actual, in with. A, well, actually, so I, don't want to, I don't want this to take so, up the conversation, but they actually do know. They do know. And so were records kept? Yes. So, so one, of the pro one of the problems is there's four things, and this is... Because you, know, you were joined the board after all of this I've happened. I've joined the board after this, so I want to educate myself on it. So rather than make a, a knee-jerk reaction like a lot of people do, I want to find out the truth. And there were four things given to the players which are all above board. But what they can't do, and this is the governance issue, which Essendon have been hit for. It's the governance thing. Is it, did you take one, one, two, three, and four, or did you take one and one, two, and three? Did I take one, one, two, not four? And that's where the governance falls down. But of what was, what was given is all, as far as I can say, above board. So then it goes to the governance issue. Which, which is a question of the board. Which is a question of the, the board, the CEO, the coach, et cetera, et cetera, all those things. So does the rest of the board, given you've only just joined, relatively, February, do they have your confidence? Do you agree with the way it's, look, that it's, a, it's an interesting one because up until Friday, it, was, it all seemed to be heading in the right direction. And on Friday, the best analogy is that we had Dennis Silly uh, in front of 100,000 people, the MCG, Dennis Silly, bowled his best ball down the ground and Sachin Tentendil could just hit it straight back over his head for six. And that's about where... And everybody went, oh, what? hang on, what's happened here? So that has, that's changed a whole lot of things. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of turmoil and it's talking about leadership. Do you think, Don, he answered that question? Well, I think he's trying to complicate it because there is a simplicity thing into it and it comes back to the players as to whether they wanted to or not. And we've got a lot of people around football now. You've mentioned about leadership groups and whatever else. And I don't believe you can, you can uh, have a board or, you know, a lot of people have got to justify their position in football and they're looking for the edge and they lose the premise of what football's about. And I was taught that football is a very, very simple game. I think life is and business is. If you can get to the ABC, not XYZ or GHIJ, get to ABC. And to me, football is very, very simple and that is getting the ball, doing something with it, but then again, respect your opponent because he's going to do something, get it, and he's going to try and do something, so you try and restrain. Now, all the rest of it, the supplements are not going to help you get the ball. Exactly. You know, they're not going to help you dispose of the ball. And it's interesting, you know, that I'm in, you know, from my era, and I listened to Cameron Ling the other day uh, commentating on or making his comment, but he was basically saying the same thing. In our days, oh, go and get the ball. You're either a squib, you're a goer or not. Nowadays, oh, they're hunters or whatever yeah. else. They just couch it in different terms. Would you and the same thing happens with the supplements as well. And look, this is one of the things where there's so many people influencing. It is, it's a simple game. There's two measurements of football. Can you get it? Can you use it? And the other thing now is, you know, who do you trust? Off the, who does you trust behind it? And who do you trust behind it? And so, Luke, if you were at a football club, take a couple of years off your age and your experience, and you were told by someone you revered, everyone's doing this. Yeah. Sign yeah. yourself a little document so no one knows about it. Come off site. Let's give you a jab. It'll make you play better. Would you do it? Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting. We spoke earlier about you know young guys asking questions and that these days. And I, I I'm not at the Essendon Footy Club, so I'm not, I've been kept abreast by through the PA involvement, but my understanding is they did ask, and you know, I know their captain pretty well, I went to school with Job, and, and knowing him, I'm sure he would have asked and asked again, and, and then there comes a point though, when the, you're right, when you're told by these people that, as you said, you sign your contract to listen to and, and, and follow in terms of the club, the, the, the coach, the doctor, whoever else, there comes a time where you, you've got to say, um, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna trust these guys, and I think that's where the players are, well, that's where the sympathy lies with the players. Having said that, there was, there was a handful that didn't want to do it. I mean, I, I, 
put myself in that situation. Do I want to have, and again, this is what was reported, do I want to have 160 needles in a pre-season? Well, probably not. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's going to make me a better player. 160. And, that, yeah, and that's, so, you know, sorry, some of the facts, like nobody had 160 needles, mm. but that's what it produced. But at some stage, if you're 30, you'll start back, you know, if you're 30, you'll question, and then you'll question again and question again. If you're 23, 22, you'll question, and question, and then if you get given the right answer, you go, okay. And I said, I don't want this to take over the conversation, but it's much more complex from the inside than what has been reported. But in the end, and look, just a quick one, I get annoyed with the whole system, because if the system becomes more important than the people it's supposed to serve, the system is wrong. For an athlete, it says, if you are, uh, you're in charge of everything they put into your body. That's a beautiful thing to say. So that means if I want to go and, and poison an athlete, and I poison them and kill them, it's not my fault, because he should have known what went into his body. That's where the complexity of it happens now. That's, that's if you take that to the nth degree. So who's leading it? Your club? Well, hopefully now the board is, but back then, I'm not sure... If, there's a whole lot of governance issues about a whole lot of people that wasn't done very well. But if the same board is in now that yes. allowed the wrong people to lead, then hasn't the board failed in its governance? Well, that's a very good question. So do you support the current board? Yes, I do. You do? Because... Because for, for anybody to have a very simplistic view and say, let's just go and have a route and get rid of them, that says a whole lot of things that about... We're not looking after players, we've given up. There's a whole lot of issues there that I said I don't want to complicate the, the conversation with, but you have to keep making sure you're doing the right thing and the right, the right motivation is the best thing for the players and the best thing for the club. And that's been my motivation and that's what I've tried to bring to the, the board. Luke, any thoughts? Or just too touchy? Oh, well, I, I just hope for the players' sake that it's cleared up. Um, I, I'm not sure what Friday means. I, I don't know whether Asada's sitting on other things. I know you said that they know the four things that, that, that have been taken. Asada seemed to be sitting on a couple of cards that they've, they've got up their sleeve. I, I don't know what, what that's all about. Um, it's, do you know what the thing that I find really interesting in a non-football sense, just taking it out of who knew what and where? It's where, in terms of leadership, what is the club showing? You know, like, are you loyal to the people that you've played with and that you have relationships with and so you will fight, fight, fight to protect their reputations and their place? Or are you loyal and show leadership towards this amorphous thing that is a club? Hmm. Which I have to say, you've been in a relationship with longer than you have been with your wife. Ooh. 40 years. Don't, don't tell her that. That's, she'll get upset about that one. Um, She's known about the mistress all along. In, in actual fact, that's incorrect because I started playing football before I'm... Yeah, no, that's right. It's about... <laughs> about no, I'm just... Mary it's, about six, about six <laughs> it's about six months, I think, yeah. 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 So, like, who do you show loyalty to in terms of the leadership? Oh, no, it, it, in the end, I mean, it's, it's an old... In the end, it's, it's, it's shareholders. There's, share, there's, there's members, there's people who back the club. They're the people. What is, what is in the best interest of the club? That's the ultimate, ultimate choice you've got to make. Hmm. Interesting. So, you know how we say that football is a microcosm of society? Of life. Of life. <clears throat> is it? Because in life, when you lead... Does there have to be a loser? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> really? Why? Well, he may be aspiring to be a leader. Um, he'll make decisions that won't, um, that won't be conducive to the whole group or whatever else. So someone's going to miss out somewhere. Even in a committee, I mean, uh, you'll make a decision or the majority will make a decision. There's going to be a loser in that decision. So the whole concept of, like, win-win doesn't exist in the Don Scott paradigm? What, win-win? Yeah, the whole win-win situation. Yeah, yeah, of course it does. Oh, you know, it's win-win. But you just said someone had to lose. Well, someone does have to lose, and that's just life. I mean, we all will go for a job, a job interview. Someone's going to get it, and somebody's not going to get it. And that's been life since Adam was a boy. You're either going to live or you're going to die. I mean, if you don't go and hunt and get food, you're going to die. Someone's going to go on. So that's, it hasn't changed. Life hasn't changed Do like that. Do you think, Simon? Um, in football, well, yeah, you, somebody, you know, the game is about win on, win on, you win and you lose. Simple as that. But... I think again, you know, the ne leadership going forward is well. You talk about sustain, you know, you talk about growth, or you talk about sustainable growth. You know, if you start talking about the environment, um, seven billion people plus. If you don't start coming up with better answers, and this is what I talk about leadership about thinking outside. If you don't start coming up with better answers than what we've had, we're going down the p path of path of making this planet not livable. So, and a lot of people, a lot of people bring the I'll win and you lose, and I don't care as long as I get what I want, and the rest of the world. Um, 
it starts to fail. And so the win, the win loss, the, you know, you can. I think you can have win-win, and I, and I think there's sustainable growth. But you've got to then compromise, and uh, you'll have to compromise. You're talking about the environment. You've got to compromise then, and you can't compromise in the environment. You've got business, and you've got the, you know, uh, the environment as such, and. They're compromising at the moment, and so you can't compromise in some situations, Simon. But I think that's what I think we have to start thinking about that. About um, how do we, and not about footy because we love we love sport. It's about winning, but how do we come up with better ideas about how we do things? Uh, and I mean, I'm sure all of us out there could actually think of one way we could do something better. But we we're used to our habits and what we do, and I, and I think we could all get a win-win situation in some certain some circumstances. Luke, um, does someone have to lose? Well, no, I, I'm, not, I'm just sort of, I'm more drawing it back to leadership and, and my um, my take on leadership, and it's probably not relevant to the win-lose thing, but, but what good leaders do, what I've seen them do is, and it might sound simple, but knowing the right thing to do or, or um, you know, what is the right thing to do at a, at a given time and, and finding a way to get it done. And there's... Again, that sounds simple, but there are there are elements that make it difficult. And, and, I was and I'm say, thinking at a footy club here as well. What makes it right? Uh, Is it just right, good? Um, well, decent? from a, in a footy perspective, the right thing to do on a ground at a given time, or or the locker room, be it ripping down a, a photo that might be offensive to people. So you could say that we failed there. But there are, whilst that seems simple, there are things that make it complex, and I think. We talk about it, we spoke about it at the club a lot, the, the, the notion of being liked versus being respected. Everyone likes, but everyone would like to be liked, um, but when that um, critical time comes to maybe challenge a mate of yours that, or, or pull him up on something that, that might make you, or it might, might mean you have to sacrifice some of that element of being liked, but you know, the long run you're going to be respected. And, and the guy that did that the best was Nick Maxwell, and say what you like about him as a player. He was unbelievable at that. It didn't matter who it was, um, and, and, I th and I believe from an early age, from when he started, and that's why he emerged as a, as a leader and a captain, that he, he, he pulled up whoever it was um, at any given time, whether it be his best mate or not, about if they weren't doing something right or, or doing something to compromise the culture of the club. And, and I guess that's the other, other element of as well, is, is being willing and being able. Um, a lot of people uh, are, have the ability to do it but aren't willing to do it. Um, and, and vice versa. So um, it's a pretty simple sort of take on leadership, I think, but that's sort of how I see it. And that's where, it, in a footy um, sense, and, and, but as we've spoken about, in a broader life sense, that's where it can be, can be pretty sort of... But complex. in football, Luke, I think, and maybe Simon, you agree too, it's a very basic sport. Now, we've been very, 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 very lucky to have played in premierships. Mm. Now, I started at Hawthorne when Hawthorne weren't much of a side, and... Uh, there is a real honesty amongst players when they're in a top team. Ah. A real honesty that just didn't exist, you know, when you're a bottom floundering team. And we're lucky that in life, that honesty doesn't exist in business and in, li and, 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 and in general life. We've, we've never, you know, if you haven't played a sport at a top level, and I'm not being elitist when I say that, I just think I'm very, very lucky to have, have done that for that honesty. So therefore, authenticity and being your word still mm -hmm. is the measure of a great leader, man or woman. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Integrity, doing as you say. I think you know, the word culture gets thrown around a lot, but it's essentially at a footy club, the behaviours that, re that you reward and the ones that you walk past and ignore, well, they're the ones that oh, I'd hazard a guess that the... The clubs that have been down the bottom struggling for a while, um, they might never know they're doing it, but they're the ones that they're consistently churning out, whereas the clubs that the Hawthorns and the Sydneys that have been up the top for a while and, and really deviate from those, from those behaviours, they're the ones that they just tick off day to day. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to pause the conversation here. Would you welcome back Dan Kelly with Memphis and Madeline Kelly singing the Spencer Davis Group's classic, I'm a man. <laughs> My pad is very messy. I got whiskers on my ah. chin, and I'm all hung up on music. And I always play to win. Ah. I ain't got no time for loving, cause my time is all used ah. up just to sit around creating all this groovy kind of stuff. Ah. Cause I'm a man, yes, I'm a man. 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 Yes,
Yes, I am, but I can't help but love you so. I'm a man, yes, I am, but I can't help but love you so. Well, if I had my way of matters, I'd be playing for the cats. I was sitting around and grossing mental chatter, wondering where it's at. Sitting around relating how strong our wills can be. Resisting its invention from every go we see. I'm a man, yes I am, but I can't help but love you so. I'm a man, yes I am, but I can't help but love you so. I got to keep my image suspended from the throne. Look into the kingdom where the people are all known. They think that I'm inhuman, they think that I'm a stone. Think I got no problems and my toilet's lined with chrome. I'm a man, yes I am, but I can't help but love you so. I'm a man, yes I am, but I can't help but love you so. Yes, I know. 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 the Kelly Gang, man, Dan, Madeline and Memphis. This is 774 ABC Melbourne, the conversation hour and big ideas here at the Wheeler Centre. We're running out of time so we have to go really quick, fellas. Your tip for the grand final. Well, I tipped Fremantle last year. I'm sitting on the fence, so I think it'll be a good game. You've got two contrasting styles and after last year... I've got a lot to learn about football. <laughs> How do you think the number 23 will go for the Swans? Actually, he's improved as a footballer. He was an athlete playing when he was at Hawthorne, but uh, he's now starting to use his body. He's starting to use a little bit upstairs. And, um, yeah, I like him because Sydney he is now that. becoming a footballer, Who's which is three? different to a Who's year number 23 an athlete. for Hawthorne now? Don't Beg you? your pardon? Who's number 23 for oh, Hawthorne Oh, it's embarrassing, now? isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> there is a tradition at Hawthorne. I... Actually, when I got 23, Luke, uh, it was a jumper presentation and uh, John Peck, mm -hmm. he was a leading goal kicker and uh, he was a captain and whatever else at Hawthorne. And I just remember I used to hitchhike home and uh, I used to get the Box Hill Post Office on the corner of Station Street and Whitehorse Road, got dropped off there. I walked a mile and a half to Woodhouse Grove time. on that night and I just floated. And I slept with number 23. Aww. And it meant a lot to me because of the tradition it was held. Uh, held and uh, unfortunately, it's... I don't know who's got, got it <laughs> now, but it's oh, not right. Tim O'Brien, I think it is. He'll be all right. Simon, you think so? your tip. Uh, it'll be a draw and we'll back, be back the week after, OK? Oh, draw. <laughs> Luke, you've uh, done that. I have, yeah. I wouldn't advise that. It's not, not great fun. Although the week after was good. Uh, I... Due to my early allegiances, I, I think the Swans are close on Toss of the coin, though. Two best teams, which is great. They're playing off. And um, I wouldn't mind if the big number 23 for Sydney kicked six or eight and won the Norm Smith medal and just um, stuck it up his old team. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't a little bit of revenge. Up, just a dish best yeah. served cold. Actually, I don't I'll... know. It's funny. Sydney's made him a, big, a bigger and better footballer for me. It just made me find my inner self and when I discovered I was just completely and utterly shallow. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we've got time for with the conversation hour on Big Ideas. Could you thank our guests, Don Scott, Simon Madden, Luke Ball. Thank you. A big round of applause for Dan Kelly with Memphis and Madeline, his cousin. Thank you for joining us with Elle Forever. May football be the winner. <laughs>